You're listening to People, Places, Planet, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonpartisan, nonprofit, research and education institute making law work for people, places, and the planet. If you enjoy the podcast and want to support our work, consider donating at eli.org slash donate. Welcome to this week's episode of People, Places, Planet. I'm your host, Sarah Backer. Over the past 50 years, the U.S. has made dramatic progress in reducing air pollution. Despite increasing populations and increasing vehicle miles traveled, American cities today have much improved air quality when compared to the 1970s. This reduction in air pollution can in large part be attributed to the Clean Air Act. The basic structure of the Clean Air Act as we know it today was passed in 1970 at the height of the National Environmental Movement with major revisions made to the act in 1977 and 1990. And to tell us a little bit more about what the Clean Air Act does and why the act is important is ELI's very own Clean Air Act expert, Jared Page. Welcome to the podcast, Jared. It's great to have you on. Thanks for having me, Sarah. So the Clean Air Act, why was it created? Well, I'm so excited to be able to be here and talk to you about the Clean Air Act today. The Clean Air Act was really one of the nation's first big major federal environmental laws. It passed just a few months after the first Earth Day, 1970, and a year or so after what many consider really the first major U.S. environmental law, the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, which I know we covered on a previous recent episode of the podcast. So along with that law, the Clean Air Act really kicked off the environmental decade. In reality, the U.S. did have some air laws on the books before this, including an Air Pollution Control Act from 1955, but that law left air pollution control exclusively to state and local governments, and air quality continued to deteriorate, so particularly in urban areas. And it was that 1970 law that was really the first comprehensive approach. That 1970 law passed along wide bipartisan margins, And it's the one that folks refer to when they mention the Clean Air Act. It passed the House of Representatives with only a single nay vote and sailed through the Senate completely unopposed. So when the Clean Air Act passed more than 50 years ago, there was basically a nearly universal consensus among lawmakers that this was an important problem that needed to be addressed. And there's many reasons why the law was passed, but really the main objective was to protect human health and the environment from outdoor air pollution. Thanks, Jared. That was a really helpful introduction to the Clean Air Act. And I've seen some of those pictures from the 1960s and the 70s, and the smog was just incredible. So can you tell us what types of pollutants and polluting activities the Clean Air Act covers? Yeah, it's a broad statute. So it covers all sorts of pollutants and polluting activities. In terms of what's a pollutant, it's a pretty expansive definition. The law says that a pollutant's any physical, chemical, biological, or radioactive substance or matter admitted into the outdoor air, including any precursors of those particular pollutants. So really anything. But that's not the full story, right? So just having the definition of what a pollutant is doesn't really say how much about how those pollutants are regulated and in what way. So maybe this will be helpful for our listeners. Can you give us some examples of specific pollutants and then how those pollutants are regulated by the Clean Air Act? I think that might be a little more effective, actually. So take something like lead. Very harmful when you breathe it in. It has damaging neurotoxic effects, especially for vulnerable populations and things like carbon monoxide and particulate matter. For these set of pollutants and a few others that EPA has determined endanger public health and welfare, currently there's a half dozen that are sort of in this class. For those, EPA sets standards or pollution limits on how much of a given pollutant like lead or carbon monoxide is allowed to be in the air safely. Because these are damaging to health and welfare, the law requires EPA to set the level of pollution at a level that will protect the public health. And not just protect public health, but protect it with an adequate margin of safety. So that means you sort of find out what the level is and then you ratchet it down even further, just in case there's some uncertainty in the data or something that we don't know. 
And when we think about these set of criteria pollutants, EPA sets standards for these called the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, or NACs. And a string of cases that have to do with these NACs have really established that when EPA sets these standards, they are unambiguously barred from considering costs. Health is the overriding concern. So they're not looking at how much is it going to cost for someone to install pollution control equipment in order to achieve these air quality standards. They're looking at what is the healthy standard. So that was the NACs. That has to do with these sort of six criteria pollutants. But of course, there's more pollutants than those half dozen out there. The Clean Air Act also covers what are called hazardous air pollutants, right? There's almost 200 of these. In fact, right now that counts up to about 188. These are things like mercury, asbestos, chromium, things like benzene that you can find in gasoline, methylene chloride, which is a paint stripper and a solvent that's used in many industries. There's also emissions from other large and ubiquitous sources of air pollution. Think new motor vehicles, power plants, other industrial facilities. So the Clean Air Act covers these two. Like I said, it's a complex law. It reflects the many and varied ways that our air and environment can be polluted. Thanks, Jared, for that excellent explanation. You mentioned that EPA takes into account public health when setting standards for certain pollutants. What else does EPA take into account? It depends, again, you know, on what we're talking about under the law. So for some pollutants, Congress was clear that the level of cleanliness in the outdoor air was the ultimate priority. Congress's goal was to make sure the air was clean enough to breathe without creating serious adverse health risks. For those pollutants, and like I mentioned, think like the criteria pollutants and the NACs, Congress looks at health-based criteria, like the likelihood of adverse health consequences, like asthma, heart disease and death that might be associated with varying levels of exposure to a particular pollutant. But for other things, it's not that way. So it's not health-based. And in other contexts, Congress directed EPA to take a more technology-based approach, set standards not based on health, but based on what a given technology can do in a certain situation. So what's the best level of technology for certain operations like pulp and paper mills? or what's the best level of technology for coal-fired power plants. And then you set the standard at that level, regardless of whether that level of technology does a great job or a terrible job at protecting public health. That's really the same for motor vehicles. Switching gears here, Jared, are there any particular examples of how the Clean Air Act has been successful in reducing pollutants? Yeah, it's a good question. And there's a lot of areas, really. Probably the most obvious is lead and lead in gasoline. Now you go to the pump and everything says unleaded and all gas has been unleaded in gas stations since 1995. Outlawing lead in gasoline is a major reason for the reduction in lead emissions in the air. But I'll just mention maybe one other area. And this gets a lot of attention as a success story under the Clean Air Act. That's the acid rain program that was established in the 1990 amendments. Acid rain, it happens from the emissions of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides and the way those chemicals react with compounds like water, oxygen, and other things. And really how you get sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide, which are the precursors to acid rain, are from burning fossil fuels for electricity. Acid rain is really a big problem because it can travel long distances and the area where the pollution is happening isn't always the area where they're experiencing the worst of the effects. The solution that Congress developed to address this problem was based on a cap and trade model. Fairly simple economic solution. It says we know there's a problem when we have X level of emissions. Let's sort of set a cap at that level and then will apportion allowances among the emitters so they can either use those allowances themselves or they can sell them in a marketplace. But the key is just setting the right price of allowances to make sure you have a functional marketplace and you're pricing them appropriately to the pollution. I think by many metrics, this cap and trade program for acid rain has reduced pollution substantially. One acid rain indicator saw a drop of more than, I think, 70 percent between 1990 and 2020. And a long term monitoring program at EPA that looks at surface waters and the impacts of acid rain shows more than an 80 percent improvement in monitored streams. That's positive, but I would say that it's not all perfect. The current levels that are set 
do sort of make it unlikely that certain sensitive ecosystems will make a full recovery from the damaging impacts of acid rain. And there's still certain hot spots. So you mentioned the EPA, and I want to know a little bit more about who implements the Clean Air Act. Is it just the EPA? It sort of works a little differently, depending on the exact provisions that we're talking about. But really, the law is designed as a partnership between the federal government in the air context, that's the US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and the states. So it's a framework that's actually quite common in environmental laws that we call cooperative federalism. There are some things in the law where EPA takes the lead and some things sort of where states do. Again, this is like the Clean Air Act envisioning both federal and state governments working together to tackle the problem of air pollution. Take the NACs, the criteria pollutants, for example, that I mentioned earlier. EPA does a lot of the scientific and technical aspects of this, setting the health-based standards for these pollutants and setting the deadlines for achieving compliance with them. After EPA does that, states have the primary responsibility for figuring out how they're going to ensure that sources in their state comply to meet the standards for those criteria pollutants that EPA has set out. And so states do this by developing state implementation plans, what we say in Clean Air Act lingo as SIPs, S-I-Ps. So to develop a state implementation plan, a state would look at its emission inventories, a list of what sources will emit what within that state. And they look at computer models to see if there'll be any violations from those sources over a given period of time. And if they project that there will be, then the state needs to submit a plan that shows how it'll control pollution from other sources so that it won't exceed the overall standard for lead, again, for example. Once a state develops their state implementation plan, EPA then reviews the plan to see whether it looks good or not. If it's inadequate, actually, the statute provides that EPA fills that role and then develops their own plan, what's called a federal implementation plan that's used instead of a state implementation plan. So pause for a second. What goes into a SIP? You know, we're looking at whether or not the state is in compliance with some of these pollution standards. So there's a set of provisions that apply when an area is in compliance with the air quality standards. In the air context, we call that in attainment. And another set of provisions that apply whenever an area is out of compliance or in non-attainment. For clean air, there's clean areas that are in attainment, and there's dirty areas that are designated as non-attainment. This is done on a per-pollutant basis. An area might be in attainment for lead, but in non-attainment for particulate matter 2.5, for example. And I think it's just interesting to note here that a different set of provisions apply. So for clean areas, states have a greater level of discretion in making sure they continue to stay in compliance. EPA gives them a little bit more leash. But for dirty areas, there's a more rigorous approach. You already have bad air, so we're not going to give you as much wiggle room. Any new sources constructed in that area have a more rigorous permitting approach than new sources that are in clean areas. So you asked about who implements the Clean Air Act. And so I started by saying it's a partnership between EPA and the states. But I just want to note that EPA does do a few other things that they have the role in implementing. And one is setting nationally uniform standards, things that apply across all 50 states for just a couple of things. One of those is new sources. So new sources that might emit air pollution, a new facility that's getting built and is going to result in some new emissions. So mostly a collaboration between EPA and the states with some things that the EPA does sort of exclusively. Thanks, Jared. That's certainly helpful. And you mentioned permit programs. So did you say that these permits apply to all new sources of pollution? Yeah. So any new source will need a permit. So you mean no matter where you are in the U.S., if you're looking to build a new power plant, for instance, you need a permit from the EPA? There are some things that might matter about the amount of pollution that you're emitting. And if it's below a certain level, then you might not need a permit. In most circumstances, yeah, major industrial facilities, if you're a new source and you're going to be polluting, you're going to need a Clean Air Act permit. Thanks, Jared. So far, you've mentioned EPA, you've mentioned the states. Are there any other actors that play a role in implementing the Clean Air Act? Courts play a role, too. 
courts review agency actions, planning documents, permitting decisions, enforcement actions. And so I think it's just really important to note that there's a critical role played by the courts in outlining and determining the scope of the Clean Air Act and the authority of what EPA can do under that act. And can you give us an example of when the court has played a significant role in articulating what is and is not allowed under the Clean Air Act? I think one of the most well-known cases, and certainly one of the most well-known in administrative law, is Chevron versus NRDC. It's a Clean Air Act case. There, the justices were looking at EPA's interpretation of specific phrase, a term in the Clean Air Act, stationary source. And so EPA had interpreted that phrase broadly, and NRDC wanted a narrower interpretation. So the result of the case, beyond whether EPA had adopted a valid regulation or not and had reasonable interpretation of stationary source, was in the test that the Chevron versus NRDC case outlined. Just as John Paul Stevens articulated the two-step framework that judges have applied for the last 40 plus years when they review agency interpretations of their governing laws. For those who aren't familiar, basically the Chevron doctrine says whenever a given law is silent or ambiguous, then judges should defer to reasonable agency interpretations. So the Clean Air Act and this idea of a stationary source is a perfect example of this idea that courts have a role to play in determining and outlining the role for EPA and how the act gets implemented. Interpreting stationary source meant that EPA was going to take on some level of policy discretion. And these decisions made at the agency level are often predicated on detailed and scientific technical analysis that the staff are trained to do. Yes, and as we know, the Chevron Doctrine has been overturned. I'm going to link to the episode that you and I did all about Chevron in our show notes. Jared, we mentioned how the EPA sets these standards. And a question I have for you is, what if states want to set more stringent standards than the federal ones? Some listeners will know, I think, that California gets special treatment in the law here, and the Clean Air Act actually allows the state to seek a waiver that exempts them from a state setting their own motor vehicle standards. And if that doesn't make sense, let me just break that down quickly. So the Clean Air Act was passed in part because state programs weren't making enough progress. The act told states, EPA, not you, is going to set the limits for car admissions. But California wanted to set even stronger limits than EPA was going to set for motor vehicles. Their air pollution back in the 1970s, especially in urban areas, was really bad. So the act gave EPA that authority to issue a waiver to California that would allow them effectively to set their own standards. And they've been granted that waiver dozens and dozens of times. And now there's even other states that follow California, too. The waiver has been the subject of litigation, especially recently, and so I'd sort of expect future waivers to possibly be challenged too. But it's an interesting sort of nuance within the law there. You mentioned cap and trade, and of course we've all heard of cap and trade in the climate context. So is there any connection between cap and trade, climate change, and the Clean Air Act? That's a great question, Sarah. And the brief answer is not really. There's the acid rain program that has cap and trade, but there isn't a cap and trade program for climate pollution under the Clean Air Act. But the Clean Air Act does play a pretty big role in terms of addressing climate change generally. I'm sure our listeners know that climate change is driven by human caused emissions and the emissions from many of the sources that we've been talking about today fossil fueled power plants, vehicles with combustion engines, many other places. And since the U.S. doesn't have a federal climate law, how the Clean Air Act regulates these greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, methane, that come from these sources is an important piece of the puzzle. We could talk about emission standards for landfills, we could talk about incinerators emission standards, but it might be more useful when thinking about the Clean Air Act and climate is one or two momentous court cases that relate to the intersection between these two issues. 
Listeners may be familiar with the 2007 U.S. Supreme Court case, Massachusetts versus EPA, right? And I think according to some, it's the most important environmental case ever decided in the U.S. It started when the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, along with a few other states, a couple cities, petitioned EPA to regulate greenhouse gases from new motor vehicles. And they wanted to do that because they were concerned about climate change and the climate impacts specifically for the Commonwealth, coastal erosion, sea level rise that were just getting worse with increased climate change. And in a five to four decision, Justice Stevens writing for the court found that first the Commonwealth could establish standing in the case, that they could bring their case to court, that they had an injury, that their injury could be traced to the motor vehicle emissions and the court could remedy this problem. EPA was saying the amount of emissions that come from new motor vehicles are just too insignificant to matter for a truly global problem like climate change. But the court wasn't persuaded by that argument. And actually, it looked at the amount of emissions that were generated by cars across the U.S. and said, no, that's not an insignificant amount of emissions. That's a significant amount. Regardless of what other countries are doing, motor vehicle emissions in the U.S. contribute to the problem. And so slowing those emissions will mean slowing emissions everywhere. So beyond that sort of important standing finding, the court fundamentally said that the Clean Air Act definition of a pollutant is broad, and it's broad enough that it can encompass greenhouse gases. Really a big decision, and following it, EPA issued an endangerment finding and a cause and contribute finding. The endangerment finding that EPA issued said that six of the most common greenhouse gases, again, things like carbon dioxide and methane, that those, quote, threaten public health and welfare of current and future generations. It's worth highlighting just one other significant case that's come up since Mass versus EPA, and that's another versus EPA case, this one, West Virginia versus EPA. And it involved the Obama administration EPA's Clean Power Plan. It was a plan designed to reduce emissions from existing fossil fuel fired power plants. And it provided a few different ways that plants could achieve reductions in emissions. And one way was to shift their power generation from a facility that might be currently generating through coal to move to natural gas to have less emissions, or for natural gas plants to move to solar or wind power, for example. So following the Obama administration's announcement of that plan, of course, it was challenged in court. And in 2016, the US Supreme Court, in really kind of an unprecedented action, issued a stay of the rule. This was before the appeals court had even heard the case, and the Supreme Court didn't hear oral argument on the case. It didn't issue a full opinion. It did so on their shadow docket. But if you thought that was the end of the story, you're mistaken. So the Clean Power Plan was repealed by the incoming Trump administration. That administration put forward their own plan, which was also challenged. And after the Trump rule was challenged in court, it sort of brought to life the whole conversation about whatever happened to the Clean Power Plan. The case ended up before the U.S. Supreme Court. And in 2022, the Supreme Court struck down the Clean Power Plan. And in doing so, it announced the Major Questions Doctrine. So it said, in this case, EPA was acting outside of its lane, doing something that it doesn't normally do without a more specific directive from Congress to do the type of generation shifting from the more emissions to less emissions shifting that it was doing. So it's really a monumental case, not just for what it means for EPA's ability to control emissions from some of the highest emitting facilities in the country, but also for just administrative law writ large and for the actions for a whole host of federal agencies making creative use of statutory authorities that are seeking to address novel and pressing challenges. So since then, the Biden EPA has gone back to the drawing board. It's crafted a new rule that takes into account the directions from the court, and it was just issued in late April. Those two court cases are really important in terms of understanding some of the contours of how the act relates to climate. The act is clearly relevant for climate, Massachusetts, but also it can't do everything. That's West Virginia. So why can't greenhouse gas emissions be listed as a NAx or as a hazardous pollutant? The NAx have always really been seen as addressing local based pollution. And of course, greenhouse gases are global in nature. So there's room for it in the act, but it's an unlikely fit. 
What about hazardous air pollutants? EPA can list hazardous pollutants based on their adverse environmental effects. And we know greenhouse gases have adverse environmental effects. So what about that? Well, EPA has typically administered the hazardous air pollutants as health-based, not based on the environmental effects. Again, it's just not really the right fit. So there's a challenge with getting creative, and EPA's now decided to take a more incremental approach, right? Continuing to ratchet down emission standards and simultaneously investing in renewable energy and capacity building. So I know that the Inflation Reduction Act or the IRA of 2022 changed the Clean Air Act. And can you just speak a little bit more to some of these changes? You know, one thing that made headlines at the time was that for the first time in the law itself, not just in a court case or in one of EPA's rulemakings, greenhouse gas is designated officially as a pollutant. So that's important. The court had acknowledged the reality going back to mass versus EPA. Now we have Congress saying it, and that carries more weight and often can be harder to undo. So in reality, though, of course, EPA had been acting as if greenhouse (laughs) gases were pollutants for quite a while. Congress in the Inflation Reduction Act told EPA to revise the reporting guidelines for oil and gas facilities of their greenhouse gas emissions. And the reporting is going to help determine which facilities are exceeding their limits, limits for methane, for example. And if they exceed those emission limits, they'll need to pay a fee. And so EPA in general, I think, has really started to do more to curb methane emissions, including leak prevention and investing money to deploy what's necessary to achieve those reductions. So, Jared, my final question for you before we go is, how does the Clean Air Act apply to environmental justice? And is there an intersection between environmental justice and the Clean Air Act? And can you tell us about that intersection? Absolutely to both. So one of the areas of the greatest intersection between the Clean Air Act and environmental justice is the permitting program. And I just want to pause for a moment to plug the pro bono clearinghouse at ELI. And there's some amazing resources there, including a community lawyering guide that covers this exact topic. It's part nine of that series, and it's called Clean Air Act Permitting and Environmental Justice. It's got an overview of the law. It walks through each area of permitting, discusses how permits for new sources and Title V and operating permits can incorporate environmental justice communities and their concerns. And gives a little overview. It's a great document. So just a couple of takeaways that I want to leave our listeners with about all of this. First, it's that environmental justice, that specific language, that terminology, it's not listed anywhere in the law as a specific factor that needs to be accounted for during any aspect of the permitting process or the planning process. But that doesn't mean that other words, phrases, and provisions haven't been used or could be used in ways that do incorporate these ideas. And I'll just give you one example. So according to a couple of law professors, Richard Lazarus and Steph Tai, there's language related to permit authorizations that allow states and EPA to include conditions that are necessary to ensure compliance with other parts of the law. So basically attach something to the permit that means with this included, it's more likely you'll be able to comply with the law. And they argue that one of those parts is the citizen suit provision that allows any person basically to bring a lawsuit for a violation of the Clean Air Act. And under their theory, if you require someone who's applying for a permit as a condition of getting that permit, that they take steps to ensure that an affected community and that community's right to use that citizen suit provision and pathway, ensure that that isn't obstructed, that might be a condition that is necessary to assure compliance. And so that's an interesting way of taking something that doesn't specifically say environmental justice, but maybe using it towards an environmental justice ends. There isn't a lot of text in the law itself, but EPA has issued many guidance documents. It does tell you how EPA is thinking about this issue. And in 2022, EPA's Office of Air and Radiation Office issued a document on principles for environmental justice and air permitting. And it presents a framework with eight principles that EPA staff might employ when reviewing permits. This applies to EPA staff, but there's a note in there that encourages sharing the document beyond the agency so that EPA staff, but also state staff and tribal partner staff can also benefit from these principles. And some of these things include using EPA's screening tool 
EJ screen, which can help identify the communities that need to be engaged early on in the planning and permitting process. And other principles emphasize aspects of BPA's environmental justice definition, fair treatment, meaningful involvement, things like that. I think one important aspect of the guidelines is to have a fit for purpose environmental justice analysis that can be adapted. So regardless of the specifics, there are a few basic elements that sort of any EJ analysis should take into consideration, and that's demographic and health data, especially the data that indicates vulnerabilities in the affected population, a baseline of existing data, an evaluation of the facility or company's compliance record, and whether or not the permitting action might have possible health or non-health adverse effects. So that sets a baseline bar for what analysis is related to a permit request. Although, again, as the guidance suggests, it's a jumping off point, and really there ought to be a guidance that's fit for purpose, tailored to the individual site and affected community. Well, Jared, thanks for being on the podcast today. It was a pleasure to learn about the Clean Air Act from you. Thanks for listening to People, Places, Planet, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute. Our work wouldn't be possible without the support of people like you. If you'd like to learn more about what we do, attend one of our events, or support our work financially, head to ELI.org.